Well, today we're going to go to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. And while we're going there, I want us to think about choices. Talk to me. What are some choices we have to make that aren't easy? And they don't have to be like life-altering. What are some choices? Yep. Getting up in the morning. Yeah, that's... Actually, that was me this morning because the dog wanted up and it was early and I was tired. Like, should I just make Amanda go by herself? No, okay. I'll, I made the choice to go. <laughs> Any other choices? Anyone else? Come on. No one's making choices? Dan? What was that? Careers. Careers yeah. Yeah, that's a, a big choice to make. Yep. Yeah. Penny? Paying the government back. I don't know if it's a choice because eventually they'll lock you up. It doesn't work for the politicians, but if we do it, then they lock us up. Martina, did I see your hand? Yeah, yeah, we have a choice. How do we react in situations? Do we, do we fly off the handle or we choose to collect ourselves before we talk? Did I see another hand or no? Oh, Wayne. What was that? Who you're going to marry? Yes, yes, that's an important choice. Again, yeah, very important. That's why we need to seek God's will in that. Deborah, obey God. A huge, huge decision there, and we're actually going to see that today here in Genesis 13. One of the decisions I wrote down is married couples. How many of you have a hard time deciding what to eat, especially if you go out? Wayne's looking at Barb. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't have a problem with that? No? I don't, Amanda and I have this problem where we're both hungry and we just can't decide. And a lot of it comes from, well, what do you want? Well, I don't know. What do you want? You know, and it's, it's kind of back and forth. Now, I got to be honest, when we went to the States a few weeks ago, usually we stay two nights and we go to Olive Garden the first night and then Texas Roadhouse the second night. Because Amanda likes Olive Garden and I like Texas Roadhouse. I didn't even give her the option. Now, we both like Texas Roadhouse, but we, we went there. We did not go to the Olive Garden. And I made that decision. That was bold. That was bold. But, you know, that's, it, it's tough. And I think, you know, you get into that place. Actually, while I was putting this together, Amanda texts me, as she often does, what do you want for lunch? And I answered it with, I don't know, what do you want for lunch? <laughs> You're making it, so like, I'll eat anything, you know? But uh, a lot of that comes from just a selflessness. It's, it's I don't want to make the decision. I'm happy with whatever you want, you know? And, that, and that's the way we should be. We want to be selfless. But I'll tell you this. If you come to my house and we serve you pie and I've got two pieces and one's a little bit bigger, I'm taking the bigger piece. <laughs> That's where I, I, I get off the rails there. When there's, a, when there's pie, and I can tell one piece is a little bit bigger, here, you have the other one. <laughs> you have the other one. But a lot of the times we are selfless. Like I can think of times where we would order out or something, and one of the kids didn't get what they were supposed to get, so I give them mine. You know, you just, it's common, common nature, I think, for a lot of us to just try and give to the others. But today we're going to look at a, a kind of a look at... But, between selflessness and selfishness, and, and this, this example here with Abram and Lot. So let's go to Genesis 13, and I'll read 1 to, to 8 first to get us started here. Genesis 13, verse 1 says, And Abram went up out of Egypt, and he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold, and he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, or it can also be pronounced Hay, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, and had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together." And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. So here we have Abram, and, and, 
And uh, the Bible says he's very rich. He's got lots of cattle. He has lots of gold and silver. So he, he's got a lot. He, he, he's, uh, he and his following are large. Let's just say it that way. And then in verse 5 it says, Lot, who is Abraham's uh, brother's son, Haran's son, Lot, um, he also had flocks and herds and tents. And with all these things that both men possess, that's a, a lot of people, a lot of animals, a lot of things, and it says that the land couldn't handle them. So if anyone that's a farmer would know, there's, there's only so much cattle and livestock you can have on your property before you either need more property or you need to start making ground beef, I guess, is what you have to do. But you can only have so much cattle for the land and so many people for the land as well, and that's what's happened here. So in verse 7, it says that, that trouble arose, that the, the herdsmen of At, Abram's uh, lot got into it with Lot's lot of people, the, their herdsmen, and, and strife comes up between them. And, and at this point, right now, it's just the herdsmen. It's not between Abram and Lot. But uh, Abram's going to, to see this happening, and he doesn't want it to get worse. He doesn't want to cause a family, family dispute. That's a good choice. It's a good choice. When there's a potential for a family dispute, we need to do everything we can to avoid that. We need to make it right. So here's where we're going to see the contrast between selflessness and selfishness. Look at verse 9. It says, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. This is Abram talking to Lot. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou depart to the right, then I will go to the left. So Abram gives Lot the choice. He says, if you want the left, I'll take the right. If you want the right, I'll take the left. And uh, whatever you want, it's up to you. And now as you think about that, who's Abram? Well, he's the leader of the pack, right? He's the one that's leading everyone around. Not only that, he's the elder to Lot, right? He's older, he's his uncle. He also had authority. You know, as being the oldest and the elder and leader of the pack, he had the authority. And he also was the richer of the two, because it talks about Abram having riches, gold and silver. It doesn't say that about Lot. It said he had plenty of cattle and, and uh, livestock and that, and tents, but it, but it doesn't say he had the riches. So Abram had the higher stature. He had the higher authority. So really, he had all the right in the world to choose which one he wanted, Right? But he didn't. He didn't. He deferred to Lot and said, here, I'll give you the choice. That's selflessness. <laughs> you know, when you've got that much power, sometimes it's pretty easy to say, well, I'll just take what I want. And you get the leftovers, like I do with pie. But uh, nonetheless, Abram was selfless. And that comes from God. That comes from God. That's not just something that we naturally want to do. It's, it's from God. Because Abram knew that no matter which land that he ended up with, God would bless him. He'd already made the covenant with him. He'd already promised him. He was confident in God. So he was like, you know what? You take which one you want. You take whichever side you want. If you go left, I'll go right. And vice versa. And now this is where we see the selfishness. Look at verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zorah. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. The thing that caught my attention was, Lot doesn't even stop and question that Abraham just gave him the choice. You know, when you're lesser in authority, you would think, no, wait a minute, this should be your choice. You know, reverence that position of Abram. And he should have stopped and said, no, you know, are you sure about this? I don't want to stop, we don't want to stop people from blessing us. Don't get me wrong, okay? If someone blesses and says, I want to give you this, that's fine. We don't want to stop that. But Lot didn't even question it at all. He doesn't pause to say, you know, no, this should be your choice. And then it says in verse 10, it says, Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld and beheld is important because it's not just looking. That word behold means to fix your eyes upon with attention. It's more than just looking. He beheld it. Lot saw, Lot wanted. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's kind of what that's saying. Why, why did Lot behold it? 
Well, because it's lush. It's compared to the Garden of Eden. Like that, that's a pretty big comparison. And, and it also says it's compared to Egypt, where they had just come out of. Because they'd been in Canaan, there was a famine, they had to go to Egypt. They went to Egypt, came back to Bethel, and uh, it's compared to that as well. And they just, you know, they just come out of that. And what Lot's seeing is there's plenty of opportunity here. It's lush. It's a good land. And I want it. <laughs> he doesn't question that, that Abram's giving this to him. And he would have thought that he would have given Abram the choice. Or maybe the right thing would have been to do, and probably most of us would do this. We see the two options. You know, there, there's two lands here. You see the lush one. Obviously, the other one's not as nice because look how big this one's talked about and how nice it sounds. The other land's not as nice. If you had the choice, what would you do? Especially if you're a husband. You give your wife the nice-looking one and you take the lesser, right? I think we would all probably want to do that. That should be our heart. That's selflessness, saying, okay, you gave me the choice, but I'm going to take the less desirable one and give you the nicer one. But Lot didn't do that either. He didn't do that either. And uh, that shows his heart. It was a selfish decision. And this is a picture of how sin works, too, because now we're going to see where that selfishness now leads to temptation. It leads us down a path when we just start focusing on ourselves. So then look at verse 12. It says, uh, so Lot's gone, uh, we'll pick it up in 13. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. It says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. The Bible wouldn't note that unless it was important, right? <laughs> There's a purpose why he pitched his tent. And that word towards, it, it, it means in direction to. So he purposely pitched it to look. It's like, you know, if someone that builds a house and they're on a lake, they put a nice big window in their cottage or their house or whatever so they can see the lake. Well, Lot's just set up his tent so he can see Sodom. That, that's a view he wants to see. He was curious. And, and he wanted to look towards it. He wanted to investigate it. To, because to, be, to have towardliness, I, this is actually a word, but, but he was having towardliness. It was what Lot had in his heart. It means a readiness to learn. To be investigative. To look at. You want to know more about it. When you, when you have towardliness, when you're looking towards and have that interest, and that selfishness took him into a place of now temptation. He set himself into a tempting spot. So the path just keeps going on. And where does this all ultimately end up taking a lot? We know, if you look over in 14, uh, verse 12, chapter 14, verse 12, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. So now he's dwelling in Sodom. He hasn't just pitched his tent looking towards it. Now he's dwelling in Sodom. So we know where this took Lot. That's the slippery slope of selfishness. It's incredible how one, one decision of selfishness led him to temptation and then just led him right into the sin. Like it's, it's a slippery slope. Now we can look at this and we, we see Lot and his lust of the flesh and his desire to, to just get what he wanted and be selfish, but this passage in 13 is also a great example of how to be selfless, if we look at Abram. So look at verse 14 in chapter 13. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, uh, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord." 
So here's Abram. He's the opposite side of the spectrum. He was selfless. He gave Lot the choice of what he wanted. Once Lot's gone, it says that, once Lot's gone, then God shows him what he'll get. He gets everything he sees around him. He says, okay, Lot's gone now. Here's what you get, Abram. You, you did the selfless thing. You took the righteous path, and you're going to get everything you can see. And not only that, he, he, he renews his covenant with Abram and says, listen, you, you, your seed's going to go on forever. And not only that, your seed's going to be abundant. It's going to be like the dust of the earth. We couldn't count the dust on the earth, but your seed is going to be that abundant. He, he renews that covenant that he made with him back in chapter 12. And, and where he promised, you know, I make you a great nation. And he just renews that. And Abram was selfless. He, he did the righteous thing by avoiding the possible strife. That was the first thing he did. He saw there was a problem and decided, you know what? Let's go our separate ways. And you know what? I'm even going to give you the best choice too. Like, let's, let's avoid problems. Let's avoid any sin. Let's avoid any hard feelings. And now, to further that, I'm also going to give you the first choice. That's a lot of selflessness there, considering the stature of Abram and who he was. He had every right to take charge. Abram could have just said, you know what? I'm going to take charge and just squash out any strife. We're going to stay together. Yes, the land is abundant, but we're going to stick together, and we're going to make this work, and we're going to find other land or whatever. He could have said that, but he didn't. He didn't. He was selfless. And once Abram and Lot got to their own lands and set up the dwelling, we see the heart of each man. We, set, we see where their attentions were, their affections were. Look at verse 12. We'll read it again. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Lot, he focused his heart on what he lusted. What he lusted. He wanted to see what this sin was all about going on in Sodom. It looked good to him. But then the contrast of, of what Abram's focus was, and that's in verse 18. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Abram focused his heart on who he loved, not on who he lusted. He loved God. That was his focus. That's selflessness. And we all come to crossroads in our lives, don't we? Many times. There's probably not just one crossroad. We have multiple crossroads where we have to make a decision. And God places a, a fork before us, and we need to choose wisely. Do we take the selfless path? Because I, I, honestly, most of the time, that, that selfless path is God's path. <laughs> Often there's two choices. And, and the reason we struggle is because one's a selfish path. And we know we want it, and we try to make every excuse we can to take it. But usually God's path is always that selfless path. It's that path. Sometimes there's decisions where we just don't know, and they can both be... You know, it can just be truly a tough decision. But boy, there's a lot of times I can think back in my life. There's a path, and it's like, I really want to take this because it looks good. But, you know, I, I'll make a million excuses in the world. Oh, I, I can have a business partner that's, that's unsafe. Yeah, I, he'll get saved eventually. I'm going to take that path because that's what I wanted. The selfless path is, no, God, I know you don't want that. I'm going to follow this. It's not as lush and green, as exciting as I thought it was going to be, but I need to follow that self, selfless path. And we all face those, those crossroads in our lives. Do we take what looks good, or do we take the wrong path? And like I say, I've, I've made that mistake many a time. Now, this is just something I notice, and it, it might not... It might not mean anything, but I thought it was kind of cool. I'll ask you the question, which way did Lot end up going, left or right? Right, you're correct. You're correct, he went left. Because I thought, of it, I thought, you just skim through it and you think, well, he went east, so he went to the right. He took the right path. But they were in Bethel, which is to the north, and if you look at the plain of Jordan, if you're looking from the north to the south, the plain of Jordan would have been on the left-hand side. So Abram took the right, the right side. I just thought that was kind of cool. It probably just a coincidence. Maybe not. With God, a lot of times you can't make stuff up. But, you know, Abram took the right path, and Lot took the opposite. I just thought that was pretty neat. So the question is, what's the application then for us? 
You know, out of, out of this passage and, and this selflessness and selfishness, what's the application for us? And, the, you know, when we read God's Word and we, we see this type of example laid out for us, just like Brother Tricky said last week, we need to stop and look at it and say, how can I apply this to my life? Ian? Well, one example, we know we're not ended up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And, and that's why we need to look at it. Not only can we see the choice, but also the result and, and the, the trail of, that leads you into sin. You know, it's a slippery slope when you start going down it very quickly. That's why God warns us over and over and over. You know, we, some people see God as just this hard person that, uh, that tells us we can't do everything. It's like, no, he's just trying to stop us from taking that first step so we don't end up in the gutter. That's, and it's all out of love. It's all out of love. Well, this story here should make us look at our motives. That's kind of what I took out of this, and this is something God's been working on me over the last year, but what are my motives? Are they selfless? Or are they selfish? Are they for God and others, or are they all about me? And here's some questions that I wrote down. First was, do I spend my life focusing on getting blessings from God or blessings to others? Am I worried about me and my blessings or am I worried about being a blessing to other people? Because, you know, that, that's a hard question to ask ourselves. A lot of the time we might say we're trying to do the right thing, but am I just doing things to get what I can get? Lot could have either given Abraham first choice or, or taken the less attractive option but instead he didn't even consider Abram. He didn't even consider being a, a blessing to him. It was just like, no, I'll take this blessing. I'll take it. Give it to me. Do we see the needs of others or, or the opportunity to be a blessing to someone else and say, I'm going to do that instead of blessing or trying to get a blessing for myself? Are we always focused on our wants, our needs, our desires, or our trials, our problems? That's being selfish. Not that we, we can't have a concern, but if we put all that first before seeing other people's needs around us, that's, that's selfishness. And a good indicator of this, I thought about this because I've been guilty of this in the past, a good indication of we're being selfish or selfless is in our prayer life. When we pray and talk to God, is it, Oh, God, I have this problem. Oh, God, I have this need. Oh, God, will you do this for me? Oh, God, and then, well, I'm going to pray for this person at the end or not even pray for anyone else. <laughs> That's a selfish attitude when we go and pray and talk to God. You know, I've, I've learned just through God teaching me that I'm selfish that, you know what? First, the focus in prayer needs to go to him. And, and getting in the right mind space and worshiping him and praising him, and then it needs to be on others and all the other needs that are around me because I really don't have it that bad. You know, I, I need to be praying for others. And then at the end, okay, then, if I have some needs or, or pray for my family or whatever it is, you know, it's just Jesus, others, and you. That song we sing, the joy club that we have, that's why we do it, putting that right focus. Are we selfish? when it comes to others, or are we selfless? The second thing I wrote down is, is God the focus of my life, or am I the focus of my life? Now, we don't have altars built in our homes, but are, are we focused on spending time at the feet of God? Because obviously for Abram, God was his focus. As soon as he set up, as soon as he got the land and set up, he built an altar unto the Lord. That was his focus. But, when Lot got his land, the first thing he did is pitch his tent towards the next sin that he could find, the next, the next thing he could do to, to fulfill his lusts. The focus was on himself. So like I say, we don't build altars at home, but is our focus God? Are we on our knees? Are we in our Bibles? Are we focusing on him? Or do we spend too much time guilty of this, pitching our tents towards our TVs, towards our computers? towards our devices, towards our hobbies. <laughs> Guilty, you know. We, we pitch our tents towards these things that they're really the focus. God's just an afterthought. And I thought about that. There's 24 hours in a day. 
And let's say, I know some of you don't, I aim to do this, but don't sleep eight hours a day because that's what's recommended. I try with a dog, that doesn't happen. But say we sleep for eight hours a day, that leaves 16 hours of our day for work, for whatever, right? 16 hours. So imagine if we gave God a tenth of our time like we do of our finances. Not saying we have to, but would it be wrong? <laughs> you know, give him of our first fruit. He's giving us our time. If we were to do that, that's, that's just over an hour and a half each day. Is he really the focus of our lives? I know there's, you know, I, I wouldn't say my Bible time and, and my devotion time and all of that's an hour and a half. But I would say there's a lot of time. It's probably more than that because of the meditation time and thinking and talking to God throughout the day. So, so what I'm trying to get at here is, is our focus on us or is it on God? Is it on others? Is it selfless? Because if we're just getting up and, and we're reading our Bibles and we're praying and we've got like 20 minutes invested and then I'm not thinking about God the rest of the day. I, I check that off my list already. And he's not your focus. You know, I'm not saying you have to sit there for an hour and a half every day. Some of us probably wouldn't have the time to do that. But accumulatively, is there an hour and a half of the day where you're focused on God, giving to God, you know, prayer, reading, learning, meditating? When you think about it, an hour and a half is not hard to do. I probably waste that much time on my phone. Really. <laughs> so, so many things we pitch our tents towards. Are we selfish with our time? Or do we give it to God? And, and are we selfless with it? Lot sure wasn't. And then the third thing I wrote down, does God get the praise for what he does in my life? Or do I rob him of the praise he deserves? Abram ended up building an altar unto the Lord. And that came from a thankful heart from God. He didn't get that lush green land, but in no way was he disappointed with the way God blessed him at all. You know, he built that altar. He had a thankful heart. He, by the end, he's praising God. That's his focus. As for Lot, he didn't even think about praising God. He should have. The lush green land, yeah, there was, there was some things he could have turned his back to, but he still had a, a great land, a lush green land that he got. He totally forgot God. Didn't even think of him. Instead, he toward his, turned his attention toward the sin. Just took him right out of the equation. And that made me ask the question, do we praise God for everything that he does for us? Do we really? Or do we just keep taking those blessings of God and selfishly, you know, keeping that to ourselves as though we earned it, we deserved it. I don't need to praise you, you gave it to me because I deserve it. That's what Lot was doing. When we're selfless, we're being like who? We're being like Christ. <laughs> you know? And when we're being like Christ, Christ needs to get the glory. People need to see that we're being like Christ. Who, who's more selfless? I thought about this. Who's more selfless than God? He made all of us. We all turned against him and sinned. And then he says, you know what? I, want, I love you so much. I want a relationship with you so badly that I'm going to die and pay for your sin. That's the ultimate selflessness. It really is. But do we praise him for that? Do we even praise him for our salvation as much as we should? I'm guilty again. You know? Are we selfish with our praise? Do we keep it to ourselves or do we share it with others? Because when we praise God, not only is he getting the glory, but we're encouraging other people to see God's real in my life. That's an encouragement. That's being a blessing to someone else. So here we had two men with two directions to choose. One was selfless and one was selfish. And both were just a matter of the heart, really. It boils down to a matter of the heart. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And both men showed their hearts, didn't they? They really did. Abram was selfless because he loved and he worshipped God. And again, who's more selfless than God? And then you've got Lot. He loved and worshipped himself, really. He didn't think about Abram. He didn't think about God. He didn't think about anything. He didn't even think about the people he was with when you think about it. Because he pinched, pitched his tent towards Sodom. 
Think of everyone that was with him, his family and the herdsmen, and like he's leading them into a path of sin as well. He, he thought of no one but himself. Selfish. And, and he didn't just pitch his tent towards sin. I mean, we all sin, right? But look at verse 13. Look at this description of how sinful it was. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. This was abominable sin. This was bad, bad sin. God hates this sin. That's what abominable means. He hates it. The slope of sin is a slippery one. And it can come from just being selfish. We would think selfishness, we, we tend to be like that. Kids, when they're, they're growing up, it's natural. It's part of our sin nature. We're selfish, right? We think, okay, well, that's okay. I'll just, I got a little bit of selfishness. No. <laughs> that's the first step into temptation. And that temptation is the step into full on right into the sin. And not just, it doesn't just stop at, I don't want to say the little sins, but you know what I mean. It'll, it'll carry you farther than you can even imagine to the place where you're living in Sodom. It's a slippery slope. It takes us down that fast. And, and like I say, that's what I've been praying a lot about over the last years. God, search my heart. What are my intents? Because my intents really show, am I being selfless or selfish? Are my intents about what can I get? What can I do? What do people think of me? What a, me, 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 <laughs> really. Or is it selflessness? Is it seeing needs in others? Wanting to see souls get saved? Wanting to see people's lives changed? Do I want that? What are my intents? And, and it's so important to just pray. I'll tell you, it works. And it won't work the way you think it will. Praying and asking God to show, show your heart. Show that wickedness in me. And you'll just think, oh, he'll show me that. And then I'll say, oh, yeah, I need to get rid of that. No, he's going to test you in it. And you're going to have to really, really struggle to get out of it. <laughs> and say, no, I see it, God. I see this wickedness in me. Wow. This is awful. I need to get rid of it. It's not just going to be, oh, here it is. I highlighted it for you. Now just fix this. It's going to come through a trial. But I can tell you it works. It really works. Let God search our hearts. Make us as selfless as possible. Let's pray.